Hello and welcome to Tomlin's Harmonica Podcast, where I'll be hanging out with players and teachers and having conversations loosely based around harmonica. This week's guest is a prodigious talent on both diatonic and chromatic harmonica. He's a Berklee College of Music graduate and he stings harmonica player. He is Shane Sager. Welcome to the podcast, Shane. How are you doing? Very good. Thank you for having me. Great honor to be here. Oh, it's, it's absolutely my pleasure. Uh, so uh, whereabouts are you based? I am based in Boston, Massachusetts, um, in New England. Uh, and uh, I live right downtown, right across from the uh, from Tremont on the Common. Nice. And um, yeah, it's, it's right. Great view of the city. I've lived in this apartment complex my whole life, which is 26 years. Wow. Okay, cool. And uh, how, how's it looking at the moment in, uh, you know, COVID land? Um, it's okay. It's, I mean, the, I, I try to get outside as much as possible and just go walk around. I ride my bike a lot. Um, Boston's a great city for, especially on the Charles river, just riding your bike around and going for a run. Um, but from what I can tell, it's pretty, pretty deserted outside. Mm -hmm. Um, I think people are taking the stay at home order very seriously, which I'm glad they are. Um, but it's it's looking up. I, I think there's been a decline in cases recently, and um, yeah. So it, it seem it doesn't seem like we're through it, but it seems like we're doing better. Very cool. That's that's uh, that's good to know. Um, yeah, we're kind of in the same boat where it's it's quietening down a little bit. People people are, are struggling to to stay indoors because you know it's spring and it's getting nicer and nicer. Um, mm. So it's it's sometimes a little bit difficult. But uh, yeah, I think people generally are, are taking it quite seriously, which which is cool. Um, I got to say, I, I'm a massive fan of Boston. Uh, we uh, we went there for our honeymoon uh, a couple of years ago, um, and it was uh, such a nice place. We want to we want to go back, and uh, mm -hmm. yeah, very cool. So, what, what, what whereabouts were you were you exploring in the city? Uh, so we did so much tourist stuff. So we were staying in Jamaica Plains um, and then just kind of taking the uh, the train into into the city every day. Um, mm. And it was around the 4th of July. Uh, and 4th of July is actually my wife's birthday. And it was her 30th birthday. So, you know, th you, you guys put on fireworks for her birthday, which was amazing. <laughs> um, that was very cool. And yeah, we did a bit of Cambridge and, you know, all the museums mm -hmm. and... It was it was very very fun. Although it was the middle of the most insane heat wave ever. Um, yeah, <laughs> yeah. I well, I used to live um, when I was at Berkeley. I lived in a in a apartment that was uh, kind of two blocks from the campus on uh, Hemingway Street, which is where all the Northeastern and Berkeley kids tend to congregate. Um, and the apartment I was in, the the air conditioning broke. Uh, I think it was the second summer I was there, so I was running. I don't know, 10 fans all at oh, one no. time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it, it feels like it, it's a city where it's not really designed for, for lots of heat. And if you do get a, a heat wave, you have to just go to a shopping mall and stay in there in the air con. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. The, the, there's no airflow. It's just kind of, it's very like still heat. Yeah. It's just like you're walking around in a, in a sauna or a steam room. Yeah. But it's it's still still a great place, and I remember one of the places that I wanted to visit was Berkeley, and uh, we went to the top of this. I can't remember what the tower was, but this massive tower across the road from Berkeley, and I just kind of stared down. I was like, "Oh my god, there it is!" <laughs> At the, uh, the probably the Prudential. Uh, yeah. The, yeah, yeah, yeah. Very cool. Um, so yeah, you were saying that you're getting out on your bike, uh, and uh, I noticed that you uh, you also do quite a lot of other kind of sporty stuff. You're into mm -hmm. your boxing. Are you uh, are you able to train at the moment? Uh, not as I'd like to. Um, I you know the great thing about where I live is there's a great uh, it, just in our apartment there's a great gym set up. So there's free weights and there's a bike and. Uh, so we're able to get some kind of activity, me and my dad and my mom and people who are living here. Um, but no, I can't, there's no heavy bag. There's no sparring partners. So it, it's, it, it's a little more difficult, but, uh, yeah, I miss it all the time. Yeah. yeah, I can imagine. And, and like, 
I, 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 I've never done any kind of uh, combat sport apart from capoeira, which is kind of as, as low contact as you can get. Um, but like, do you, do you have a, a certain energy that you're not getting out? Not sparring? No, it, no the, the, the way I've always looked at boxing is that it was a, uh, it's a discipline. It's, it's a lot like playing music. And in a lot of ways, being a musician actually helped me a lot with, with boxing and, you know, I, I'd say 90% of it is rhythm and 90% of it comes and me originally. So just a little background on me is originally I was a drummer. I, okay. I started playing drum. I started playing drums when I was nine in harmonica when I was 13, 14. Um, so the rhythm transferred very nicely to the things that uh, are involved in boxing, such as rhythm of the punches, jump rope, all, all that, all that stuff. So it was just a good way for me to be active. I used to be uh, decently overweight, um, but uh, bo- bo- boxing helped me to uh, to kind of come around. Very cool. Well, uh, pe- people can't see you because this is this is an audio podcast. But but Shane is a, a very uh, physically fit looking twenty six year old, <laughs> uh, a, a very handsome man. So uh, w- well done. Uh, and you uh, you're also into your scuba diving as well. Yeah, so part of uh, us traveling is that we're uh, put into kind of uncomfortable situations sometimes. And uh, the first time that my sister and I and my dad, oh, my dad had been a couple times, but the first time we went scuba diving was uh, about 10 years ago, and it was in Egypt in a place called Sharm El Sheikh. And uh, we, unbeknownst to us, there had been, I think it was like 10 shark attacks the summer before. <laughs> <laughs> but no, no one said anything, which was great. But the diving experience was great, and it's just it's another world when you're doing that. And me and my sister, who had never done it before, were a little nervous about it. But on the second day, we were going down something like 40 meters. Wow! So we were we definitely plunged head first in, into it. And on the last night that we were in Egypt, we did a night dive, which you need a long time to do. But we just decided to do it. And of course, we went diving in a place called Sharks Bay. <laughs> <laughs> so it was a little scary, but it, but but it was a lot of fun. And um, we I think dove two other times throughout the last um, ten years. But uh, it's just a great experience. Nice. So, so I mean, like I I I have a whole list of things that I'm going to do when we can start traveling again. Uh, it, it sounds like you you probably have like a whole bunch of stuff that. But like, what's the first thing you're going to do when, when everything's uh, back to normal? There's a lot, there's a lot of travel, physical related things that I want to do. Uh, there's countries that I still haven't been to that I'd love to go see, like New Zealand and Romania and Peru. That there's, there's a lot of places I'd like to go see. Um, so I'm, yeah, I, I keep a journal every day and I always keep, like, if I think of a new place I want to go to when all this is over, I just write it down. <laughs> very cool. Very cool. Okay. Well, we, we've, we've alluded a little bit to, to travel and things and, and we are going to talk, talk about music, but uh, uh, I also want to ask you a little bit about your, your origin story because uh, I, I started reading about it and it uh, seems that you've had a slightly unconventional childhood. Uh, do you want to tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, that, that's a that's a very good word for it. Um, so, uh, grew up in Boston, and um, when I was about six years old, and my sister was about nine, um, my parents decided uh, to take us both out of school. Um, so I guess that would have been when I was in first grade, um, and we decided to go out on the road go out into the world and um, try to find ways to be useful. And the places that we were going were not uh, really places that a lot of people were traveling at that time, such as Rwanda, Nepal, um, Pakistan, just all. And But the whole thing here is that we were living there on the ground for months at a time. I think it was that we spent almost three months in, in Nepal one time. And wow. there were other countries too that, become second homes, uh, Bhutan, South Africa. I think now, I think I did the counting the other day and it's something like 65 countries that I've been to. <laughs> That's um, nuts. But so we would go, uh, the first time that we went out, we went out for a year, um, a year straight just traveling. And it was just a great experience for me and for my family. And 
it kind of spawned this uh, foundation called the Sager Family Traveling Foundation and the Roadshow, which we've continued now for about uh, almost 21 years now. Um, so traveling has always been a big part of our lives. And since that uh, trip that we took in 2000, we've taken something like, I don't know, 50 trips. And the trips would range from being two weeks to being another, another year-long trip. Um, and it was all living in these places like Rwanda and Nepal, uh, just trying to be as helpful as possible and being close enough to the ground to actually listen and make a difference um, in a real way, mm. in a sustainable way. That's so, so cool. And it was so surprising because I, I, I've been reading so many harmonica player biographies uh, in preparation for, for these podcasts. And you know, most most of them are fairly standard. The origin stories are are fairly standard. And then I got to yours, and I was just like, "Wow, that this is this is not what I expected." Um, mm. w- was it kind of? I, I think a lot of a lot of kids would maybe find it quite stressful being taken out of mm-hmm. school and and traveling like that to not exactly kind of spa destinations. Uh, mm. Did you find it stressful, or was it just a big adventure? I mean, honestly, when I, when we first started doing it, I think I was too young to really like understand what stressful really meant. Um, so in doing it, it, it it felt more like kind of just work, like, like this was what we were supposed to be doing. Mm -hmm. Um, and as a result, you know, my classmate for, for most of my uh, childhood was my sister, um, which was really cool and definitely brought us really close together. But it never felt, uh, I mean, obviously there are some situations that you're in, like if you're seven years old and you're in Pakistan in the Khyber Pass where Osama bin Laden was, that's, that's kind of uh, a, little, a little stressful, but you only figure that out several years down the road. Um, but it was never, it, it was always, uh, we always felt safe and um, it really, uh, it was very important work that we were doing. So it always, it always felt like that. That's very cool. And uh, the foundation's still still ongoing, isn't it? Yeah. Um, we have had our kind of big project is with um, the Dalai Lama. Uh, it's that we, I think starting in 2000 was the first year, we uh, began this program with His Holiness that was um, teaching Western science to Tibetan monks. Um, and it was it is the single biggest uh, change to the monastic curriculum in almost a century, wow. um, which is really cool. And the Dalai Lama was very adamant about the monks learning science. So we've uh, invested a lot of money and time into that project. Um, we built science centers all over India, which is where a majority of the Tibetan monks are now, because obviously Tibet is kind of a mess right now. Um, yeah. So a lot of the trips have been to these monasteries and living with the monks, seeing how the classes go and bringing these Western scientists from Emory University is a big contributor to all this too. Um, So bringing the scientists over to teach science. But now, since the program has gone on for this long, now the program is shifting more to the monks being teachers of science, which is really cool. Wow, that's very cool. So, you know, you're, you're a pro harmonica player, um, but, but I feel th- this sounds like this is probably something that you're still going to be involved in uh, forever. Is that, is that right? Yeah, absolutely. It, it's, definitely, it's definitely been a huge part of my life and will continue to be a big part of my sister and I's lives. Um, my dad still does the majority of the work. Um, uh, sorry, my parents do the majority of the work. Um, but... Yeah, it will always be a big part of our lives and the lessons that we've learned and the experiences we've had have very much influenced us both as people. Very cool. That's uh, that's awesome. And was there anything that you wanted to be be before you decided to, to be a musician? <laughs> um, when I was really young, I, 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 my first aspiration was to be a zookeeper. Okay. Um, like when I was in kindergarten. Um no, it was always, uh, I, as I mentioned, I, I started playing drums when I was nine because um, I saw the movie School of Rock and I thought it was the coolest thing ever to play the drums. Nice. 
Um, so I begged my, I begged my mom to get me a drum set and she did, which was great. And I had got a teacher and I got pretty serious about it pretty quickly. So I felt like, and then I had my first concert, I think like six months after that. So I think it was after that concert that I really decided at nine that like, this was going to, if it wasn't going to be my career, it was going to be a big passion of mine in my life. And as I got older and I got more and more serious about it. Uh, it, uh, it became more and more apparent that music was going to be my, my life. Uh, that's very cool. Joe, this, this makes me feel super old, uh, which I, I don't feel a lot of the time, but School of Rock is the movie that I saw and made me want to be a music teacher, uh, you know, <laughs> after I'd been a musician for a while. <laughs> so that's quite funny. Uh, I think that, that, uh, that film has a lot to answer for, probably. <laughs> yeah, and, and, it, and it was great too. It was a nice, like, I think before that, like, I don't really remember the kind of music I was listening to, but that movie kind of introduced me to ACDC and Black Sabbath and all these bands that I, that I love, Led Zeppelin, all, all these bands that I love and that I grew up listening to. So definitely owe a lot to that movie, the yeah. more I think about it. I thought those are serious drum bands as well. Uh, do you still play drums now? Every now and again, um, I... Uh, was giving drum lessons for a little while uh, when I was home uh, about a year ago. Um, but every now and again, the gig will come up and I'll play drums. Uh, I don't really have a style that I fit into with drums. That, like for years, I was a just John Bonham, like meathead. <laughs> I, I, I just, I just want to, I just want to hit as hard as possible. Um, but more and more as I got older, I liked you know joe jones and buddy rich and and people like that that i that i really dug and of course uh, james brown's drummer clyde stubblefield was a big influence on me um so every now and again a jazz gig will pop up and i'm a little hesitant about it but i'll, I'll always do it nice that's very cool uh okay so let, let's let's move on to to harmonica because uh, you, you started playing harmonica uh, well, you said when you were kind of 13, 14, uh, yeah. which I, I feel is quite early. And most of the people I've spoken to, they, they kind of come to harmonica late teens, early 20s at the earliest. Um, mm. what, what, what inspired it? So I was a, in addition to being a drummer, I was also a very serious soccer player. Um, I was a, I was a goalie for, for many, many years. Um, and I had a game. I was playing varsity soccer when I was 14, 15, when I was in high school, which, and I was also the youngest person on the team. So it was, a, it was a big deal. So we had one game where I went out to go break up a play as a goalie. And, uh, I ended up busting my finger really badly. Um, and had to have surgery and have my arm in a cast for several months. Um, which sucked because it meant that I couldn't play the drums. However, uh, I still really wanted to play music. And uh, I was asking my music teacher, my high school music teacher at the time about, you know, I don't really want to sing because that's not really my bag. Uh, I want to, I want to do something else. I don't want to play the, the cowbell, <laughs> but, like, but what, 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 what else can I do? And he had the great uh, idea. He said, why don't you try playing harmonica? Cause at the time I would just use the rack. Nice. Um, I thought that was that was intriguing, and my dad and, uh, and my mom were both very uh, adamant that they thought that was cool, um, and I liked it because it was very portable, and you know, being on the road so much, it was just nice to to have something in your pocket. Um, the thing that really got me really into it was I'd been playing for a little while, and I studied the little booklet that was in the you know in the Honer harmonicas, uh, mm. and. The thing that really inspired me was my music teacher showed me a uh, or played me a track called Blown the Family Jewels by William Clark. Nice. Which was interesting that that was my first harmonica player and not Little Walter and not, you know, Sonny Boy or someone like mm -hmm. that. So it, once I heard that was when I got really, really serious about it, which was when I was about 15, I think. Nice. Um, and... Yeah. And from William Clark, I really learned uh, a majority of what I, uh, you know, what was critical to me playing the chromatic, um, playing third position was a big thing that I learned from him. And just that that general West Coast vibe was, was really cool to learn at such a early age. And after him is when I got into James Cotton and Sonny Boy and Big Walter and all those guys. 
Nice. Yeah, it's funny. W- William Clark is someone that I only got into um, a couple of years ago uh, because of, uh, well, a, m- a mutual friend of ours, Ronnie Shellist. Uh, I was taking lessons with Ronnie and he's like, you, you, you got to listen to William. Like that that's that's everything you need is right there. Uh, and I think he's that he's that kind of player that, that players know, but, but other people don't necessarily. Uh, he's yeah. got the, the secret, the best kept harmonica secret. Um, yeah. Definitely worth checking I- out. Absolutely, I, I completely agree. And, and I was, I was kind of taken back a little bit when I uh, would listen to Little Walter and Big Walter. Is that I thought that, you know, because I was younger, I thought that William Clark was the OG. I thought that <laughs> I thought that he, I, I thought it was like him and then everyone else because I, I didn't know any better. Like when I was playing drums, my first introduction to blues was my friend was a blues guitarist and uh, asked me to play a shuffle, and I was like, I don't know what a shuffle is. Um, but I spent a week with it and I really got to love that feel that, that uh, true kind of Chicago shuffle feel. And, um, it was, it was cool. And then, you know, being from a rhythm background, the, the stuff that I was starting to do on the harmonica was much more rhythm based. It was like that beatboxing kind of thing. And those, um, you know, those heavy tongue block, uh, rhythms, which was cool. Um, nice. Yeah. Very cool, very cool. Joe, you know, it's funny. Um, I, I I also only picked up harmonica because of an injury stopping me from playing guitar. Um, I, I my my injury is nowhere near as sexy as your injury. I I literally got <laughs> tendonitis from playing too much. Um, but but yeah, it's 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 funny that harmonica doesn't seem to be many people's first choice. But then, mm-hmm. like when you start playing it, you you get addicted, and it's uh, yeah. it's just so expressive. Um, which is something that's maybe uh, difficult to recreate on on other instruments like drums and even guitar. Like it is an expressive instrument, but I think anything that's breath linked, uh, there's just that extra extra level. Um, that's yeah, big yeah. deal. Yeah, and and especially with bending, that that was like that I kept on. I struggled for a long time with learning how to bend because I heard all this expression that was coming out of like William Clark's playing like that big four draw bend sound. Um, I just couldn't get it for, for, for a long time. Um, and then when I finally got it, I, I remember that moment so clearly. I was like, Oh, okay. Yeah. All right. <laughs> that, that, now I'm getting a little bit of expression. <laughs> yeah. Oh man. It's, it's, it's really nice. Every time I talk to harmonica players who, who are now very accomplished harmonica players, uh, it's nice hearing, you know that everyone has followed that exact same path of you know you start and then you want to make those noises and you can't make the noise and you're just like how how do i do this and then you have that breakthrough after lots of effort uh, mm-hmm. and that's what everyone everyone has and i think students sometimes forget that you know when they're when they're listening to to someone uh you know playing on on stage or on recording they're like oh it sounds so easy it's so effortless but it it's the same path for absolutely everybody yeah, and and I think it's really interesting too. And what I'm discovering more about myself in quarantine and with all this woodshedding time is that uh, there are things that I didn't put a lot of time into that I always wanted to learn how to do. So, for instance, me who was uh, pretty much exclusively a lip purser for a long time, um, I uh, worked on a lot of tongue blocking, a lot of doing octaves more, and all the effects that come with tongue blocking, like the flutter, I could. See, I, I go side to side. I can't go on and off. Okay. <laughs> uh, I, 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 I just, I've, it's always been like that. I know there's a lot of players who go on and off versus to the side, mm-hmm. but that's something I've been working on a lot. So it's interesting because you can just always keep learning. There's always something new that you can, or a new technique uh, that you hear someone do and it's like, oh, I never really thought to do that. Yeah. That's what I'm discovering more and more. Definitely. Well, it's it, it's cool. It sounds like you've uh, you've taken uh, a slightly bad scenario that we're all in at the moment, and you've turned it into something super positive. Uh, what what yeah. else are you are you working on uh, in the woodshed? I mean, I've actually because I spend when I'm on tour, I spend so much of my time playing the chromatic um, that it's it. I don't really prioritize the diatonic in the show. I only really play diatonic on one or two songs. Whereas with the chromatic, I'm playing like eight songs mm-hmm. on, on the chromatic. So much of my practice time when I'm on the road is based in chromatic. So it's been nice to come home, to be home and to 
revisit all the stuff like uh like even just like learning how to play juke correctly or, or there's something like like these little things that i never really learned because i got so serious about the chromatic um so the kind of stuff i've been woodshedding is uh you know a lot of tongue blocking stuff a lot of uh overblow things connecting more of what i do on the chromatic to the diatonic so it's been an interesting experience it's it's definitely been a very concentrated uh last 10 weeks that's very cool so i mean do you do you have a preference between the two instruments between chromatic and diatonic i you know i really like what rob paparozzi says about it uh says about the harmonica is that he doesn't differentiate the two instruments and uh, that's very much how i see it they are you know if i'm going for a different feel on a song like if i'm doing playing like a shuffle and i want something that sounds a little bit different i'll play the chromatic if i'm playing you know sometimes i'll play like on on the tour i'll play a song that like you would never think would have diatonic but i want to take a risk and play diatonic so i don't ever separate the two there it's all the same Mm -hmm. Okay, that that that's cool to hear, but it also makes me feel a little bit bad because because I've just used this excuse of oh well I'm not a chromatic player so you know I I don't do it uh, and I'm more and more in fact watching you play has made me think more and more it's it's something I, I have to add to the arsenal because uh, it's such a, a great sound. Um, it, it, it it's just such a different. It, that's exactly it. It's just such a different sound, and you know it's not really uh, like it has because obviously you listen to guys like larry adler and toots and Mm -hmm. stevie and it sounds really intimidating like you hear larry adler do rhapsody in blue and you're like oh shit okay (laughs) um but for for my purposes and the stuff that i like to play on it i like to play blues on the chromatic but i like to play it in all kinds of keys and a Mm -hmm. lot of the stuff that i play uh with sting is is you know it's pretty rooted in there, but it's it's rooted in those minor pentatonic, major pentatonic things. Mm-hmm. Uh, so with with the with playing in different keys on the chromatic, um, do you play everything on a C, or do you do you play different key chromatics as well? I use uh, one other key chromatic. Um, I play the C. I said before that I play. I think it's it's something like eight songs on the or ten songs on the set. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'll play the C chromatic for all of them except for one which is um englishman new york which is a difficult song to navigate on a c chromatic okay um so i will only so for that song i will use an a chromatic just because it lays out really nicely in third position the songs in uh b minor so okay. it, it lays out it lays out really nicely in third position and that tone of that uh that opening note um, is is really nice and you can bend it really nicely on the uh, seven draw on an achromatic. Cool. All right, I, I I can visualize that. That's cool. Um, so is is uh, Sting quite prescriptive about what songs have to have chromatic on and what songs you can play diatonic on, or is it your choice? Um, you always present something. So mm-hmm. there are there are songs. Um, a good example of a of a song that we added at the end of the last tour was hung my head um which is a very famous song that uh, johnny cash famously covered but sting wrote i think it was on his mercury falling album um originally when i there's a there's a horn line in it that uh it was originally done by the memphis horns um who you know played on everything <laughs> um but i thought it sounded better on the chromatic personally i thought it had more of that horn like quality mm-hmm. But uh, what he said to me was to play it on the diatonic, so it sounded a little bit more kind of folky, which was cool. Um, and it was it was interesting for me because it just showed that we were thinking about the song differently, not better or worse, just differently. Mm-hmm. Um, so I played it on the diatonic, and it's cool because it's really hard to get um, that big octave uh, with with that note on the on the chromatic, but with that big octave on a diatonic it sounds really really full yeah okay that's really cool um so you, you've been playing diatonic a while before you you picked up the the chromatic um yeah. I, I i think i think i've i've read the origin story of why you started playing chromatic correct correctly but i, I really want to hear it from you so uh is it right that you only had three months to to learn how to play chromatic yes tell <laughs> us about um, that <laughs> 
<laughs> okay, so th this is for everyone who wants to learn how to play major third position on the chromatic. This is, this is as descriptive as I can get. So I was offered, my first time playing with Sting, I was offered a chance to play with him at a charity event he was doing in Boston for a charity called the Lenny Zakem Fund, which is great. It's a nonprofit, helps out kind of grassroots uh, organizations in Boston. So it was great. He was in New York, and he decided to come and play at this benefit. And it was me and one other Berkeley student who were playing there, and uh, his, I guess, percussionist. Um, so the song was uh, Fields of Gold, um, which has this beautiful interlude in the middle um, that's, I think, in all of his music, one of my favorite lines. And it's very simple. It's just going almost directly just down the D major scale, just down to, that, down to the F sharp. That, that's it. And it's, it's great. However, it, I think it was originally played on an accordion, so it sounded more, and unless you play in 12th position or something like that, it's not going to sound like it's supposed to sound on a diatonic. So I figured I should learn how to play chromatic. Um, I had played, like I said before, I had played like with the William Clark stuff and George Smith stuff. So I knew about the chromatic, but I was not very comfortable with it, especially not in a nuanced way. So I sought out um, chromatic teachers in Boston and the guy that I came to know and who became an unbelievably important influence in my playing and my life was a guy named Mike Turk, who was who's a brilliant, brilliant chromatic player and a brilliant diatonic player. He was, along with Will Scarlett and Howard Levy, one of the first overblowers like wow. when, it, when, it, when it first became a thing. Keep in mind, I did not know anything about overblowing, or I did. And our first lesson, I remember, he sat me down at the piano and took an out of the box Marine band in the key of C and played the whole chromatic scale the whole way up the instrument. Wow. <laughs> I was That's like, badass. Oh. I was like, oh, okay, all right, all right. So I took lessons with Mike for about three months, um, and they were very intense, and I learned quite a bit about the chromatic. Uh, and coming from the background that I did of just this third position thing, he introduced me to a new way of thinking about, about uh, chromatic. But long story short, I went and played the gig, and uh, it was very nerve-wracking, but I was able to pull it out. And I actually played on um, two songs that night. I played on Fields of Gold and then Every Breath You Take, which is an A, which is a weird key to play on the C chromatic. But... Um, yeah, it was, it was just a lot of preparation. And as a result of those three months, it kind of got me to where I am today. Mm -hmm. That's that's very cool. So like, what's what's the kind of secret source to kind of getting from diatonic to chromatic as quickly as possible? I mean, there are, there really, so when I first started to, I knew a little bit about, about theory and being a drummer, um, which we almost have like no, concept of melody and harmony <laughs> um and i had to kind of go find it for myself so the most major thing that i did was um this scale study was was just simply knowing how to play c major all the major and minor scales and all those kind of fun scales like harmonic minor whole tone scale all that stuff so i had a book um that i would write in when i when i was that age that i just wrote out i sat at a piano and wrote out all of the scales that I need to know. I still use that book to this day. Um, and just for months and years, I would just practice those scales. And, you know, unfortunately, that, that's really the best way to kind of, it, it's just different. Like when you learn a scale on the, on the diatonic, it's the same. It doesn't matter if it's in third position or second position. It's the same on every harmonica. Mm -hmm. But with a chromatic, it's a different, it's just a different way of thinking. Yeah. It's not better or worse. It's just different. Yeah. Joe, you know it's, it's so nice having someone else say it because, you know, I, I, I say this until I'm blue in the face to all my students. It's like, yeah, the, the best thing you can do is just practice your scales. And I think they think I'm kidding, but, but it's so true. <laughs> mm -hmm. I really, I really like what, what Jason Ritchie says about it is that they're like, they're like the words in the sense. They're like, it's like you learn how to speak a language, mm -hmm. but, um, you know, if you, you know, if you only study one player or you only study one feel or one scale, like you're only ever going to be limited to that. 
like if you only study the blues scale of the minor pentatonic, you will only ever be able to do that. So learning all these different scales, it reminds you that you have different colors to play with. Yeah, I think that that's a, a really, really solid point. And I think something that a lot of people forget is that, that sometimes the, the variation from one scale to, to the next is, you know, one or two notes and that completely changes the whole flavor. Uh, so you can you kind of think of things, I certainly know for me on diatonic, I think of things in terms of my kind of master scales, you know, my, my kind of major scale. And then I, I think about how something else would vary based on that. Um, mm. So like the idea of learning all of these scales in all of these positions might be a bit overwhelming. But, but mm. if you think about it as, you know, there are scales that are linked to each other and you can learn the variations that makes it a little bit easier, I think, mm -hmm. to get through it. I, I mean, the other thing is that there's a lot of crossover. There's, you know, there, there are some scales uh, on the chromatic that are very easy to learn, but there are other ones that are very hard. Like even, you know, he's one of my biggest heroes, um, which is uh, Stevie Wonder. Um, he only really, if you really study his music, he only really plays in four or five keys. And those are the those are the keys that he really lives in. Mm -hmm. um, so there are some that lay out really well in the chromatic, and just like when you play diatonic, there there are certain bends that we all love on certain key diatonics. But they're, you know, it, I don't know. It's just it's just different. Yeah, oh man, you know, you, you've inspired me. I'm definitely going to. Well, I'm going to be quizzing you more. Uh, over the coming weeks about about chromatic because uh, I, I, mm. think, I, I think I'm ready well, to be serious. <laughs> Well, well, one tip, well, one huge tip, and I heard Hank Shreve talk about this, who's a very good friend of mine, and I loved this tip for, for anyone who plays third position uh, chromatic on, let's say, a, a C chromatic, is when you play the minor pentatonic scale, which is one draw, two draw, three blow, three draw, four draw with the button in, or four blow, and then five draw. If you... So that, that two draw is your minor, uh, whatever, minor third. Mm -hmm. If you just put the button in, it gives you an F sharp instead, which is your major third. That's how you play major on the chromatic. That's it. That's the only thing you have to change. Nice. <laughs> <laughs> it's so simple. It's brilliant. <laughs> Very cool. So, but it, but it, give, it, gives you a different, it gives you a different tone. And let's say you're playing you know, a blues that's in D major. If you play, always play the mi if you always play minor, it's not always going to sound appropriate. Mm -hmm. No, that's that's a, a really cool thought. I like that. Okay, so let, let's let's go back to a little bit of uh, of the musical journey. Um, so non non musicians probably don't realize this, uh, but but when someone introduces themselves and tells you that they went to Berkeley, like you're just instantly like, whoa, this, this, this is a, a serious musician. It's very intimidating because uh, so many of the musicians that, that, you know, we all look up to are, are, are Berkeley graduates. It's, you know, it's mm -hmm. the, the best musical institution on the planet, certainly to, to my mind. Um, mm. How was it for, for someone studying harmonica, which is an instrument that a lot of people don't take very seriously? How did you find that? So I actually have to be 100% honest here. I, when I started at Berkeley, I was there for drums. Okay. That, 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 that was initially when I, when I was 18, I said, I want to study drums. That's, that's what I want to do. Really, the thing that people don't tell you about Berkeley is that, I think it's like kind of one of the better kept secrets, is that it's really a networking uh, college. Like, obviously, it's really great to graduate, and it's, you know, there have been great people like Susan Tedeschi and Vinny Caliuto who've gone on to do great things and have graduated. However, most of the people, when they go there, it's really to, to network, to learn some stuff, and to meet potential band members. That, mm -hmm. that's, that's really the, the whole crux of, of Berkeley. And more and more, that's becoming the case. Um, so when I went, uh, I went there with a focus in drums and I went there for uh, around the time of my second year. I wanted to really study harmonica because all of the stuff that I was playing, all the gigs I was getting were all on harmonica. They weren't on drums. So I approached the board and said, like, I, I want to do this. Like, th I want to play harmonica. And there were several students along with me that also wanted to study harmonica. They thought it was it it was enough to have uh, it be a principal instrument at the college, which it's not. 
um, <laughs> the board came back to me and said, yeah, that's great, but we don't believe that it's a uh, real uh, principal instrument. Yeah. <laughs> so I, t- I, t- I took that as a stubborn 20-year-old as, oh, okay, well, then I've exhausted my, you know, th- then this isn't going to help me anymore. So after my second year, I left. I was, I was done with Berkeley. I said, you know what? I've learned what I needed to learn. I got my head on straight with harmony and theory. However, if they're not going to let me study harmonica, then this is, that's what I want to go do. This isn't a good use of my time. So I left and basically from the time I was 19 to when I was about 25, I spent most of my time just gigging really playing, you know, playing blues. That, that was my, that was my passion. That was my love. I spent it studying and I was very fortunate to have great teachers like Mike Turk and Annie Rains and Ronnie Shellist and just r- really, really tremendous teachers. Um, yeah. So I like to tell people that I kind of forged my own curriculum. Like I took the Berkeley idea, but just applied it somewhere else. So, however, my time at Berkeley was great. I met great people. Um, my very dear friend and great collaborator, a guy named Gabe Stillman, who's a brilliant guitarist, um, blues guitarist. Him and I have done some great things together. But it's been, um, I definitely learned a lot there. It's, uh, I would go back someday, but I don't know if they would have a harmonica player. <laughs> <laughs> That's very cool. I, 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 like, I, like, I like that story. And I also like... This, there, there seems to be a real legacy of people uh, leaving Berkeley to do better things. Uh, yeah. Uh, like, like, like John Mayer springs to mind. Uh, I like just, it, it, I feel like you have to go there and have a bit of it. Uh, like I had a buddy from Scotland who went and spent a semester there. He's a jazz guitarist. And he was, he was really good before he went. And then he came back and he was just unrecognizable. Like he, he completely destroyed the local scene uh he just was a whole other level uh so i think just a a little bit of the berkeley magic goes a really Mm -hmm. long way i I think another big thing that berkeley does is if you're set in one genre like if you're set in jazz or you're set in in you know heavy metal whatever it is berkeley will do a great job of exposing you to these other genres of music that you maybe would have been too stubborn to learn in you know other ways like for me as a drummer you know, I knew all the kind of basic feels, you know, three, four swing, shuffle, all, all those basic bossa nova things. But then they were introducing, you know, these really advanced samba rhythms and th- things that I had no idea how to play, wh- which was really cool. Um, and it, when I would fo- refocus more on harmonica, it pushed me more in other directions on, on harmonica, too. Like, uh, you know, maybe I, maybe I haven't explored jazz enough or maybe I haven't explored bossa nova enough. It'd be an interesting thing to look at. Yeah. Very cool. Um, so let's, let's come back a little bit to, to sting. Cause I, I, that's, that's kind of a, a big, big thing for you at the moment. Um, so you started touring with him last year. Uh, were, were you supposed to be touring with him at the moment? Is there stuff that has been put on hold? Yeah. So, um, pretty much this whole uh we were actually this week supposed to be starting the uh las vegas residency um right. which uh is a shame but um i think basically what's going to happen is everything is going to get moved a year mm-hmm. essentially so everything we were going to do this week we're going to do a year from now um which is totally fine i i you know i'm i'm very content doing what i'm doing now uh and I still give lessons and yeah, it, it's, it sucks, but it, but it's not really the end of the world. Yeah. Oh man. It, I, I, I can't even begin to imagine, uh, how awesome it must be being on the road, uh, with such a huge act, but, but also kind of playing for audiences who are actually excited to, to hear the music. Um, mm-hmm. cause I mean, you know, the, 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 certainly the blues harmonica world, you're, you're quite often spending time playing gigs to people who are lukewarm at the best of times. <laughs> and so like I, I used to play in a wedding band and I, I'm one of the few people who loves playing in wedding bands uh, because, you know, you're playing music that people love. And so, you know, when you 
kick off with Kings of Leon, Sex on Fire, and everyone goes crazy. You know, okay, it's not an amazing song, but everyone's going crazy because they love it. And you you got to go on the road with someone who people really love. That must be amazing. Yeah, and, and it's the the thing about it is that uh, it is amazing, but at the same time, the level of discipline and dedication you need to have is is pretty severe. Mm-hmm. It's you know. It's, it doesn't matter what condition you're in, you show up 100% ready to play every night. And towards the end of the tour, the last, uh, uh, whatever, the last run of the tour, we were doing six shows a week. Wow. Which, which is a lot for, yeah. for anyone. Um, the, yeah, I started playing with Sting, um, I think it was, uh, it was about a year ago. Uh, the the tour started and before that I played with him after the show that I did with him in Boston I played one other one off show with him at uh, Carnegie Hall which was really cool um, That's and awesome. yeah and it was it was cool because the unlike Fields of Gold and you know Brand New Day which is the big song that I play uh, on the road with him the song that he had me play at Carnegie Hall was didn't have an existing part to learn it mm-hmm. was you know here's the here's you know the landscape try to like paint or here's the sheet of paper and try to paint something over it which was cool it was it was very artistically difficult especially when i was that age i think i was 22 uh when i did that um and i'm pretty sure that i blacked out <laughs> <that stage. laughs> um but then after that, about two years after that, I got an offer to play uh, this New Year's gig, which uh, was a very big deal for me. And it was especially a big deal because it was on Chromatic and everyone knows the song that I was playing, which was Brand New Day. And they also know that it was famously played on the harmonica by Stevie Wonder. So it was it was a lot of it was a lot of pressure um, on me, especially to learn. And that's not an easy song to learn on the, on the chromatic, but whereas, you know, there's some other songs that are easier. This one was a little more difficult, especially with all the nuance that Stevie puts on his notes. Um, right before that show, uh, like I think it was a month or so before my family and I had, uh, we were going to India. So, we were in India and Nepal for almost a month when I was doing the prep for that show. So I would be like sitting in the lawn of the monastery that we were staying at playing this opening part on the, on the chromatic, <laughs> um, which was, it was cool. It was, it was, it was very interesting and got to New York to play the show. And it was, it was great. It's on YouTube. Uh, do a search sing Times Square New Year's Eve. Um, you'll, you'll see me and yeah, that was, and that was kind of the launching point for the, for the, for, that was like my audition for the tour, which was cool. That's very cool. Yeah. Uh, so anything that you've mentioned, I'll actually put in the, the show notes so people can just, uh, click, click straight through. Uh, and, and yeah, I, I watched that video. Uh, it's, it's, it's amazing. <laughs> it's very cool. Yeah. The, the thing that made that night very difficult was at, like if you play chromatic harmonica or harmonica in general, you'll, you'll know what I mean is that <laughs> the, it was very cold and it was very wet. Mm-hmm. Two things that the harmonica does not like, especially when you have a button that you need to work with. Yeah. Um, so there was, I remember I was, I was standing on the stage and my mouthpiece was facing up and there was just water cause it was pouring rain and it was cold. I was like, Oh God, I don't know what's going to happen. Um, but everything worked out in the end. And um, yeah, that, that was, that was really the catalyst for the rest of the year. That's uh, yeah, that's quite, quite a way to start the year, isn't it? It's uh, very, very cool. Uh, okay. Well, I, I, I want to be mindful of, of not taking up too much of your time because you've, you've been very gracious in agreeing to do this. Uh, but, but I'd love to know if there's anything that you're working on that you want me to kind of direct listeners to, to go and check out. Do you have any new projects? Um, not currently. Uh, people, if they want to hear uh, some of the stuff that I've been doing, obviously can check out my YouTube channel. Um, it's just Shane Sager, uh, harmonica player. And um, the new album, uh, the live My Songs album with Sting, uh, has me featured on harmonica and I believe five songs. Nice. Um, 
and uh, both chromatic and diatonic. And uh, yeah. Very, very cool. Well, thank you so much for, for spending some time with me today. It's been an absolute pleasure. And uh, yeah, hopefully uh, we can chat some more about chromatic at, at some time. That would be very cool. Would love that, man. Thank All you right, so cool. much for having me. And, and, and again, like to, to everyone who's been on the podcast, like Jason and Ronnie and uh, PT Gazelle, they're all big heroes of mine. So to be with this kind of pantheon of, of uh, players is a big honor for me. So thanks. Oh, absolutely. It's an absolute pleasure. All right. Take it easy. See you later. Bye. Thank you. You too. Thank you so much for listening to this episode of Tomlin's Harmonica Podcast. Don't forget to subscribe and leave a rating and review on your podcast player of choice. Join me next Monday for the next episode. Happy harping! <laughs>